Transition Radio TV brought to you by TheBreastFormStore.com. They have everything you could possibly need for your transgender or cross-dressing needs. Visit their website at www.breastformstore.com and tell them Transition Radio sent you. On a strange journey. Once upon a time, there was a little girl. The accident was over a year ago. A second woman has been elected president. A twelfth planet has been named in the solar system. The last wild polar bear has died. I slept through it all. I was here for my waking. He called it a beginning. He said it was good. I think he may have thought that anything I did was good. Welcome to Transition Radio, live from Hollywood, Florida, with your host and hostess, Mark Angelo and Jessica Lynn Cummings. of Transition Radio TV Show. So glad you're able to join us again for another Sunday of packed information, entertainment, and great guests. Yes, absolutely. And as you can see, we have a new look to our studio. And I think it looks pretty cool. It looks like we're floating in space. Yes, yes, definitely. <sighs> well, today we have Christine Beatty, a 25-year member of the trans women's community. She's a transsexual author, an activist, journalist, and musician with a distinction of being one of the first transsexual women to perform in a working, recording, heavy metal rock band, Glamazon. Since 1991, work has been seen in Transgender Tapestry, Spectator, Trans Sisters, Bay Area Reporter, San Francisco Bay Times, and Chrysalis Quarterly. She... I always get that messed up. Chrys Chrysalis. Yes. Quarterly. She has published two books and is completing her first novel, A Native of the San Francisco Bay Area. She currently resides in Los Angeles. Christine Beatty is an American girl, but not your average American girl. Her beginnings were average enough. An upper middle class neighborhood, growing up in a lovely home, attending a private parochial school with school uniforms and daily chapel. She'd always felt out of place and high school only made it worse. She made no friends and stuck to home. Only marijuana and music made life bearable. And I have no idea what I would eventually do, because originally, I was born into a male body. So I joined the Air Force. I started learning the guitar, and yet I still needed drugs, even more worrisome. In cross-dressing, I found a sexual thrill and a major obsession. Remember, I'm attracted to women, so this fetish puzzled me a lot. After my honorable discharge, I went back to San Francisco 
One day, I stumbled into a transgender bar and got the surprise of my life. A month later, I fell in love. Soon, I was engaged, and not long after I started college, we got married. Crazy, I know. But I did love her, and I hoped the marriage would fix me. But it didn't. Eventually, I found this book, and I started getting answers. When she realized she was a transsexual woman, it ended her marriage. She moved to a blighted part of San Francisco, started female hormones, and lived as a woman. She was ostracized by society, so she became a prostitute. She began shooting heroin and smoked PCP. She tried to go back to being a man. And that's when everything spun totally out of control. I'm talking a terrifying blackout, arrest, jail time, full-blown heroin addiction, and we're not even halfway through the story yet. So come on and take this trip with me. I promise you'll never forget it. And now, welcome to our show, the amazing Christine Bay. Hi. Hey, hey, Christine, how are you, sweetie? I'm doing great. A little bit tired and groggy. I guess I haven't had my morning wake-up shot yet. <laughs> oh, well, I don't do these anymore. Now it's strictly about these, you know, female hormones. I got in trouble, a lot of trouble with the other one. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. That was a very interesting uh, video. And when I was searching for videos to have you on the show, that really, that was like the perfect intro video because it gives the uh, viewers a little bit about your life and all that you have gone through. Most people don't realize the hardship that most transgender individuals go through and the battles that we have. So. Definitely well, good video. That was that was kind of the point to the video. It's like you know how you've got trailers for movies, you know, coming attractions. You're sitting through there. You've got your overpriced popcorn and and uh, your big gulp, and you're sitting there. And then they have you know ten minutes of movies that are coming up, and they have a little trailer of each movie, a, a two to three, four minutes sometimes of what the movie's about. So you can decide, you know, what you want to shell out twelve bucks for next weekend, you know, and then buy more overpriced popcorn. Uh, well, the, the video you just saw was a trailer for my book, and it's a way of letting the potential reader know what kind of ride they're in for. And to tell you the truth, I because of YouTube's rules as the kind of content you can post, I could have put in something that was a lot more, you know, even as hairy as the book, or well, close to as hairy as the book. Uh, but then they would have been pulled like that. So, yeah, you want to leave some to the imagination. I think you painted a clear picture, and like I said, very entertaining. Very keeps you wanting to definitely go read the book. So my hat off to you for putting that together. That was very, very good. I enjoyed it too. I thought it was an awesome video. Yeah. So, Christine, tell us how it was like 25 years ago when you first embarked on your journey. Um, when I first got involved with the community, you mean? Um, your entire journey. Your, your my whole, entire journey. Because to me, this is a journey. It's like getting on a spaceship and saying, "Here we go." Yeah. And well, um, and, you know. and I guess it's it's funny you should use the spaceship thing. I was just rewatching uh, Phil J. Kaufman's The Right Stuff, uh, the movie about the beginnings of the American space program and all the astronauts. That was and an awesome movie. I see the uh, really up till my. Uh, 27th birthday when I left my marriage and started transition. Um, I see everything uh, before then, the, the basic training, college, marriage, uh, my long you know, history as a pothead and a recreational drug user as being uh, kind of like my astro astronaut training. It was getting, ready, me, getting me ready for my transition. It was also, I think drugs was a way to deal with my gender issues without actually having to confront them. If I stayed stoned all the time, then I didn't have to worry about why I wasn't fitting in. Uh, I could just be, be stoned all the time and groove out on music and hang out with my friends and uh, not deal with these terrible questions. What's forcing me to want to put on women's clothes? And you know, I kept going through that whole thing. 
Yeah, being numb is something that a lot of um, transgender individuals and drugs are one of those things that help you numb so you don't have to think about it. And I think we all kind of dabbled in some sort of unhealthy behavior to try to deal with our situation. Well, and I think we did it too to try to fit in. So, I don't know. It's, did um, you not put that on? No, no, it's on Do Not Disturb. You have yours on. <laughs> It's coming through yours, thank you. Technical difficulties. Yes. <laughs> so no, I'll be a New York man. Get that crazy bitch off the air. We, <laughs> this is supposed to be a wholesome family show. I've heard about this. Yes. Lady, That's and what she's I said. a maniac. She's a pervert. <laughs> she's a whore. Get her off. Put, put, put somebody respectable on. Couldn't you guys get Chaz Bono? What kind of a second-rate show are you? Um, Not at all. Not mm -hmm. at all. Hey, we've all um, been through it. I, I think that, well, first of all, I didn't dabble in drugs. I took the plunge. I mean, I just, that was, I lived in them. I immersed myself in them. And up until transition, the, it was, uh, the drugs were to help not cope with feelings of not fitting in, feeling inadequate as a man, just a way to avoid asking myself these horribly terrifying uh, questions. But then after I transitioned, I needed the drugs to deal with society's reaction. And as the, the, the more that I lived full time as Christine, although if you read the book, you know that my original name was Pamela, uh, one of my fellow trans sisters picked the name for me. And there's a cute story about how that all came about in the book. As I went all along as Pamela in my life and learned how people were reacting to me and not just strangers but uh, people that uh, I, I worked with, fellow musicians, my employer, people at school, even some of my instructors at school. Uh, it, it's, it was very painful to be treated that way just for doing something I needed to do to be myself. and. It was as horribly disillusioning. I knew I just couldn't go back to being a guy and pretending that this never happened, that I didn't learn this about myself. And so I, I turned to harder and harder drugs to deal with uh, uh, the unending gauntlet of humiliation and hatred and so forth. And so, well, we can probably get to it later on in the interview about how I ended up being becoming a prostitute, but once I started turning tricks, then the drugs became an absolute essential. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, that's what I was saying before we got uh, so messed up with technical difficulties there. You know who that was, right? Yes, I know who it was. Yes, yeah, which I'm gonna have to like. Uh, anyway, yeah. uh, I did the same thing. It was uh, you know I got into the drug thing, the marijuana, you know, LSD. I was big time in LSD in high school and. Uh, yeah, exactly. Peace, pot, microdot. But we don't want to do none of that. We don't do the word now. Zen. Yes, I quit all that before I. Well, it was a phase. I mean, it was, it was a phase. I'm glad I went through it because. Um, it's a learning what, experience. The thing is, is that I always did LSD safely. I was, well, not always, but certainly <laughs> when I was Most first starting out in it, I was around uh -huh. people that I could trust. There was always somebody there to step in to keep me from doing anything crazy. Oh my God, that's probably my agent right now. <laughs> there are all these uh, <laughs> interruptions. I'm sorry, no, I will not take anything uh, less than two points over the movie's gross, okay? So you tell the producer to come back with a better offer. Hello? <laughs> Who's this? <laughs> Hola? <laughs> <laughs> no, like, guess what? I, I'm in the middle of, a, of an internet interview right now. We're talking about my book, and actually, uh, we could, we can do, hey, we can discuss my friend Nola once I get done with the call here. Hey, can I call you back in a little bit? Okay. Love you. Bye. Boy, okay, talk, next call. <laughs> Nola is one of the people that I met early on. Um, I met her about nine months into my transition. She'd been on female hormones <laughs> for so, quite a while at that point. She knew the community, and she was one of the people that helped keep me from doing something terrible to myself. And that was back in January of 1986. So we've known each other, God, what, 27 years. Wow. 
and uh, she's still my best friend today. And thank God that you know that we're we are two survivors. So many trans women uh, friends of mine that didn't survive. Either they succumb to a hate crime, they succumb to drugs uh, or to AIDS. Uh, it's it's those are the the terrifying three that have taken down so many of my sisters and brothers. Yeah. So, I mean, basically the question, which will lead to the next question, was, you know, 25 years ago, that's quite a long time ago, you know, were things different? And I'm sure that they were. I mean, as it is, we're still trying to educate and trying to uh, get out of the back of the bus, if you, if you may. Well, 25 years ago, there was no transgender community. Transgender wasn't even really a word. I mean, that r word didn't come out and start beginning popular political usage until the mid-90s. Um, right. So there was, there was no visible community. I had no idea that there was a Lynn Conway out there who most people probably know that Lynn Conway is probably one of the most preeminent computer scientists, trans yes. or non-trans. But she, uh, Lynn transitioned in 1969 and, you know, went deep stealth and nobody knew uh, about her background as a man. Certainly I didn't. So we didn't have visible role models back in the mid 80s. My role models were the transsexual prostitutes that were making 100, you know, 150 bucks an hour. Those were the ones that I emulated because I, that's, I had, I had no idea that you could have a straight job, a respected job, and be a trans woman. It's still difficult. I mean, I think the only reason that Lynn Conway got as far as she did back then is because she did hide, and nobody did know. So, mm -hmm. while the discrimination is still evident even today, it's better now than it used to be. It's certainly Definitely, back. and I think it's because of the visibility that we have created yes. as a community. I mean, going stealth, and no one ever really hears Absolutely. about who we are. So exactly. the more of us that are out there and just shining our bright colors and saying, "Hey, we're proud to be trans," I think the more and more opportunities we're going to have as a community in general. Exactly, I, I agree. I couldn't agree more. Let me ask you, Christine. Have you seen many changes since uh, you started your journey? Changes in what, in particular? I mean, definitely in myself. I mean, you know, <laughs> you've seen pictures. You seen after seeing that video or the pictures in the book. I mean, I've I've changed so much. Uh, I, after I had my facial feminization surgery in 2005, I went to a family. Uh, it was a Christmas gathering or something. My own brother didn't recognize me. Wow. Yeah. Okay, being on on those changes, yes, the changes are drastic. But what about the changes in society's views towards us and society in general? You know, which it's it's a hell of a lot better than it used to be. I will say that, and I think that as um, as gauche and terrible as some of them are, the words Jerry Springer comes to mind immediately, but talk shows have done quite a bit to help educate the general public into what we're all about, in that we're not all these Jerry uh, Springer uh, stereotypes. Many of us are intelligent, well-spoken, we're not crazy people, we're the kind of people that you could have over for a Sunday dinner and not worry that your silverware is going to be missing or that your, your Great Dane is going to be raped or whatever. Um, exactly. It's, it's, yeah. Absolutely. I turned down Jerry Springer, by the way. I went on my I would too. Ori I, would I turned him down. I, just, I, I like, would nope. do just about any talk show, but Ter Jerry Springer is not a talk show. It's the Lions yeah. and the Christians all over again. You know, it's, it's like, it's like the, the, the Roman games in the Colosseum. That's Definitely. all it's about. It's it's a huge slow motion car crash on camera. That's what it is. It's rubbernecking at its it, finest. Uh -huh. And it's a it's like a WWF talk show. You yeah. know, it's uh, yeah. ding ding yeah. ding. Yeah. Next round. I, I want to actually get back to where we're talking about visibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've seen um, that that great uh, docu uh, docu drama Milk. The, the biopic Milk with uh, Sean Penn, yes, yes. Uh, Gus Van Sant directed. Um, the important thing that Harvey Milk made, and they hammered on this in the movie, is that by coming out, by letting people know who we are, goes a long way into helping erase the discrimination. Because it's easy to hate, you know, a 
a concept, like you know, a those people kind of thing. But when you see it's your coworker or somebody down the block or just somebody that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, it's harder to hate somebody that you know. And um, beca because of Harvey Milk's strategy about coming out, they defeated that horrible uh, ballot proposition that was going to fire all gay teachers in California, the Briggs proposition. Uh, they brought that down by people coming out. Well, it's the same thing with the trans community. And in that sense, we've got kind of a, um, we're working at cross purposes. There are many trans women and men who believe that they should just go deep stealth go through the transition and then not tell anybody and just go through society being a, you know, a normal man or a woman and uh, nobody as much is the wiser. At least nobody that can't afford 20, you know, 50 bucks for a Lexus Nexus search. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there are, then there are those who believe that no, by coming out and showing people who we are, that we're not ashamed of ourselves. Um, that goes a lot further into erasing discrimination because, once again, it's harder to hate somebody you know. So I understand both desires, and you know I am grateful that I can sort of pass um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, really, I just you know, especially if I don't have any makeup on, I just go around in my grubbies and my blue jeans and a T-shirt. I can go into the supermarket. I can just go anywhere, and I don't get clocked because this is, after all, Los Angeles, the land of the Amazon actresses and, and models. So I just, nobody notices me. And it's really nice just to be normal and not to be stared at or yelled at or anything. On the other hand, by coming out, um, I'm getting my opportunity to be sort of an ambassadress, you know, to my, you know, for my people. So God, that sounds so damn uh, pompous, but... Yeah, you, and, you know, I wanted to add that as stealth as a person, I'm not judging anyone because anyone has the right to do with their life what they yeah. want. But when you become stealth, eventually, there's an old saying in Spanish between the stars and, and the uh, earth, there's nothing that you could keep from people. Things do come out, and then you're prone to violence and prone to somebody finding out and getting totally disgusted or yeah. feel they've been lied to, and then that's what we have, or deceived, and that's how we have. You know the violence towards us. Exactly. I have a short story Actually, I want to. There's one. There's one other danger too, and this, this was probably one of the greatest lessons that I ever got. I was at a convention in San Francisco, the Living Sober Convention for LGBT people in recovery, and I attended. They've got like uh, AA and Al-Anon and sobriety meetings, and they also have workshops that are focused on specific topics. Uh, new, being new in sobriety, being a parent in sobriety, uh, uh, sex in sobriety, uh, depression, it's just a whole galaxy of different workshops based on uh, m the many concerns that a clean and sober person would have. Well, one of the workshops, or actually they had several of these you know, each year, was a gender issues and sobriety workshop. And uh, more often than not, back in the day, I would uh, I'd be one of the co-chairs because I'd be one of the people who would actually be willing to get in front of the crowd and tell my story and I was articulate and uh, sometimes there would just be nobody willing so I'd volunteer to do it. After leading one of these workshops, this was in 1990 I think, uh, I was out in the hallway thumbing through my, uh, thumbing through my uh, convention guide wondering well, what workshop am I going to hit next and this, this petite uh, young trans woman, I think she was in her mid to late 20s, came over to me and kind of pulled me off to the side where nobody could hear us and she confessed that she was, uh, she saw me in the workshop where she sat very quietly in the back, that she was, uh, she admired me for having the courage to be out and that she had transitioned, she transitioned fully and she was living deep stealth in a lesbian community in Santa Cruz, California. Which Santa Cruz is a beachside community that is uh, about a hundred miles southwest of San Francisco. And she was living in this community and she was being eaten up with paranoia that people, you know, that she thought that people knew, that people were going to find her out. And 
she said the sad part was that she was pretty sure that her own lover knew and some of her really close friends knew and they just didn't say anything you know they they, they just allowed her to keep you know living in deep stealth and, and putting up the front and it was eating her up inside that she couldn't talk to anybody about this and it does and, because you can't hide that story of your life is part of who we are. Exactly. I wanted to say that I just started a new job and my now boss had gone to my Facebook page and found out that I was transgender. And when I went to tell her, because I'm open, I'll, you know, once they get to know me a little bit, I confess right away, hey, by the way, I was born a female, this, that, and the other. And she goes, I already knew. The day you came for your interview, I had done, before you had your interview, I did background check on you and I saw your Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And I hired you anyway. So I was like, wow, you know, so it's, it's empowering that people are becoming more and more educated because of us that have come out and educated people. Imagine if all of us became stealth. It's like, what about those individuals that cannot transition because of health issues, because they can't afford to, and they could only cross-dress. So by us doing what we're doing, we're helping the future trans generation. Exactly. I agree completely. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that, and I can't say for sure, because it's really easy to second-guess oneself. I'm thinking that maybe if I knew that there was a Lynn Conway out there, and, and Lynn, if you're listening, this is no slight on you. I understand why you had to be deep self. Um, if I had known there was somebody out there like that, maybe I wouldn't have gotten involved in prostitution. I don't know, but part of the problem was is that the universal reaction to me was so negative that it's kind of like, in a way, becoming a prostitute was like my rebellious attitude. It's like, fine, you reject me, screw you. I'm going to be a hooker, and I'm going to be a damn good hooker, and I'm going to survive. And you can't, you can't put me down. You can't make me not be who I am. And so, okay. yeah. so let's go on with the Q and A. You, you were a journalist. That's one of the things I read about you. And um, can you tell us a little bit about that chapter in your life? Yeah, easily. I started out. Um, I got bit by the writing bug um, after my transition. It was one of the ways that I was able to deal with my feelings. I, I just started putting stuff down on paper. And then when I got clean and sober, there was a newsletter that uh, one of the recovery fellowships in San Francisco, they were doing, they had a newsletter for the, the fellowship in the, in the Bay Area. And I got involved with that because I was thinking, you know, I'm sick of just writing for myself, and I wanted to tell stories. I, my big motive was to put out my a story about being, you know, a, a transsexual woman in recovery from addiction and alcoholism, and it's, you know, it was basically coming out to my the fellowship um, in in uh, San Francisco and trying to educate people on our issues. And but you know you can't I couldn't write keep writing that story so I started doing other stories as well, and I was encouraged because the articles were well received, and so I started writing for other newsletters and eventually I started writing articles for the adult newspaper that I used to advertise in as a prostitute uh, five years before, uh, and. Uh, they welcomed me. They could. They saw I could write. That I had something to write about. So they would give me assignments. I reviewed books for them. I would contribute <coughs> opinion pieces. And sometimes there would be a local event that I'd heard about, and I would call the editor and say, "Would you like me to cover this and write a story about it?" And they said, "Sure." And they, they paid two fifty a column inch, and they paid uh, twenty five bucks a photograph. So it was uh, really easy to get bitten by the journalism bug. Wow, that's awesome. Which brings me to my question. Tell us about your books and other publications. Well, um, my my the book the my my memoir, not your average American girl, available on Amazon. Uh, get the glare off there. There we go. <laughs> that I actually started when when I was. Oh, thank you so <coughs> much, Mister Mister Joe is awesome. here. I started working on this book in a Veterans Administration rehab, and I, I recall I um, recall the story in the book, where I had, I was trying to live as a guy, and when I hit bottom as a heroin addict in 1988, I was trying to live as a guy. Nola, my my dear friend who just called, 
She and I were living together as as a girlfriend, boyfriend, me being the boyfriend, and we were both heroin addicts. And we decided we were just we're killing ourselves. We got to do something. So I went into a veterans administration rehab, and Nola went to a halfway house, and we both got clean and sober around the same time. My only intention was just to to kick heroin and to, you know resume our relationship as Nola's husband and I get a good computer programming job and we live together happily ever after. The problem was is that after about six weeks clean and sober all my gender issues came back and I I couldn't talk about it because all my fellow veterans were these guys, these like ordinary blue collar guys, most of them, that I'd you know, known back then and they probably wouldn't have reacted very well knowing that old Chris down there used to take female hormones and turn tricks and wear a dress and they just so I I started writing down all of my stuff and I thought if I wrote down my life story maybe I could cure myself if I could maybe figure out where I went wrong and how this could, I could sort of write my way out of my gender issue which obviously didn't work but, <laughs> not very well <laughs> but time I'd gotten to the point where I'd gotten clean and sober and I was in recovery, and as I realized, you know what, I'm. Uh, this is just who I am. I have to accept this. But this would make a pretty interesting book, I think. And so um, I, I decided to move ahead and publish it. Well, I, mean, I tried to publish it. Let's put it that way. I got turned down by several different uh, literary agents, and they all said the same thing: "You're not famous. It's not written anywhere near well enough for us to sell it to a publisher." So, you know. Write something else and, and uh, we'll talk. And so that's when, in 1993, I wrote this. Actually, I've published three books. This was a collection of short stories and poetry. My friend Nola, who just called, she did that illustration. Nice. Um, nice. And uh, Lauren Cameron, you may have heard of him. Yes. He took that picture right there. Mm -hmm. Lauren Cameron, of course, being the photographer, trans yes. man, brilliant mm -hmm. uh, artist. And it, it's a collection of short stories and poetry, uh, a lot of it based on my transition and my drug experiences and everything. And by continuing to work as spectator, that spectator as a journalist and working on a novel that I'm still trying to finish right now, I honed my skills up to the point where I was ready to uh, release my autobiography, which we've seen the cover several times now, so no reason to belabor that point. But that's how I got started writing it, and how it it was written literally over a period of what from 1988 until uh, 2010, when uh -huh. I, I started I, I started to get it ready for publication. Absolutely. Well, we wanted to show everyone a trailer. A graphic video peek inside your book, Misery Loves Company. So let's take a look at that. Oh, this is a new one. The mid-80s almost killed me. Street walking, addiction, jail, insanity. It's a miracle I survived. It was a time like a bad accident. You can't bear to look and yet you can't look away. I knew such places existed somewhere, had seen them depicted on the silver screen in dreary melodramas. No sooner had I locked my car door, my senses were assaulted by an odor rife with desperation. The lot itself was a weathered stained stretch of asphalt, rustling with windblown trash and tinkling with discarded booze bottles like cynical whispers and mirthless titters at the entire predicament. Finally, standing in the club doorway, waiting to be admitted, I turned around and regarded this block, this sad excuse for a neighborhood. 
a living, breathing, stark repudiation of the bourgeois fantasy called the American Dream, and never imagining I would one day call this place home. All the hardcore lifer girls come here, especially when the hour grows late. Yes, sex and money so oft traded freely here, where many of the girls scrape the means to live. Bargain struck between two parties deep in need, where desires of all kinds can find release. In this, the only place quite like it here in town. Christine Beatty was living as a man when she left her wife and the suburbs and moved to San Francisco's Tenderloin District. It was the last time she'd feel any semblance of normality for the next five years. She found herself living in places she never imagined, nightly walking streets that scarcely seemed safe during the daylight, selling her body to strangers to survive, committing suicide on the installment plan one day at a time. You know, unfortunately, this is all too true for many transgender individuals. You know, how do you think we can change this? Or do you feel that it, this is an important part of our rite of passage and part of the journey we must go through as healers? It would sadden me to think that every trans woman need to be a prostitute and a heroin addict um, to, to get to this. Um, I don't feel sorry for myself that I went through this. I don't even regret it necessarily because everything that's ever happened to me has contributed to make me the person I am today and I'm not ready to ask for my money back. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's, it's a miracle. I, you know, I believe in some sort of a higher power. I'm not a religious person. I'm not a Christian or anything like that, but I do believe in the presence of a God, although I call her Goddess. And I think it's largely due to the grace of Goddess that I am even alive here today. Uh, through all the drugs, through HIV, through um, all of the situations that I put myself in, or that I was thrust into, uh, that could have killed me and didn't. So. I don't think it's, ne it's, a ne uh, it's a necessity. I would be happy if, if trans women and trans men in the future could be just like any other kid uh, with a medical condition, get the support of their family, their friends, the community, and they could uh, just step forward and claim a life that is normal for them uh, in, a, in a community that embraces them and cherishes them and, re and values them uh, rather than ending up like, you know, well, I ended up pretty good, but I, certainly without going through the, the kind of things that I did and, and many other trans women have had to endure. Yeah, exactly. Well, Christine, it, sound, it sounds like you have had, a, had an amazing journey out of everything you have gone through. What do you think the lesson has been and what has been the most memorable of all your life's chapters? Most memorable, God. Let's see, well, since I was stoned for most of them, my memory is so <laughs> uh, Um, God. Um, I don't know. I can think maybe in terms of a relationship about, you know, the several times that I've been head over heels in love. I mean, even though they, they didn't perhaps end up, you know, happily ever after, those were pretty cool. Um, I think probably some of my fondest memories are stepping out on stage with my guitar in front of a microphone in front of a, a, a thousand people uh, or more and just getting out there and performing and just um, just being, the, I think music has probably been one of the things that's helped save my life. I love music and having the ability to get out there and perform it and you know, sing it and play it as as well as to just appreciate listening to it. Uh, music has definitely kept me sane, and it's been such a blessing to have been in a band like Glamazon, where I get out there and I'm doing something that's cool and unique and fun, 
and it's it was even though it wasn't financially rewarding it was artistically and spiritually rewarding for me so I guess really it would probably have to be you know the most fun would be a, a Glamazon gig and I don't pin me down I guess maybe performing at the um, either the Gay Pride in San Francisco or, or, or I should say LGBT Pride in San Francisco or the LGBT Pride uh, down in West Hollywood um, those were both really cool gigs. Lots of people, and we were sounding great, and people were digging us. So that's that definitely the best high one could have. Um, heavy metal is what you're into. How has the reception been from the trans community or trans women? With your well, um, especially when I started, you know, you walk into the the Black Rose or the Spirit Club, which were the two trans nightclubs. You know, when I was first transitioning. You didn't hear uh, uh, heavy metal. You weren't hearing Black Sabbath or Iron Maiden or any of that stuff. No, you were hearing Patti LaBelle and Donna Summer and you know you're R and B and disco. Uh, I think that as the community has grown, partly due to you know, internet presence and more people with with trans feelings uh, learning about uh, the community and knowing that. You know, they don't have to just stick with these feelings. They can do something, and they can find support somewhere. Uh, as more people um, choose the trans path, choose to accept it, as, as opposed to just keeping them bottled up inside and trying to, to repress it, uh, those people are going to bring their artistic sensibilities in with them, uh, the things that they love, be it heavy metal or classical or jazz or whatever. Uh, heavy metal is not a huge part of the music industry. Um, and sadly, uh, a lot of the people that like that kind of music are still sort of saddled with uh, um, unevolved, which I always say, uh, unevolved uh, sentiments towards LGBT people. And it's my hope that um, there will be more rockers out there who are trans who can show uh, the audience that, hey, you know. We're different, but we can rock just as hard as anybody else, and you can be just as into our music as you can anybody else. That was my hope for Glamazon. I think that we were really either a little ahead of our time or way behind our time, because by the time we'd taken the stage in 95, metal was pretty much dead. I mean, the mid-90s, it was all about grunge, and there weren't that many people interested in metal bands. So we were kind of late to the party in that respect. Um, well, we have or, a video clip yeah. here of your performance. We want the viewers to uh, watch firsthand. Excuse me? I said we have a video clip of your performance. We're going to have the viewers watch firsthand of you performing. Oh, great. Great. Well, you'll see my, my, uh, my, my friend Renata, who's the most amazing female guitar player in the world, and uh, it's largely due to her that uh, you hear this yes we're seeing it.
That was amazingly hot yeah. and awesome. Totally awesome. You both totally kicked ass on that one. Renata <laughs> is the greatest guitar player I've ever known, personally known, and one of the greatest I've ever seen anywhere. And unfortunately, she faces the same kind of discrimination that I did in the rock scene because rock generally tends to be very testosterone fueled, lots of guys, and women are treated more like sex objects and eye candy than true musicians. I mean, when you think about the rock scene, you think of, well, you get your Pat Benatars and, and so forth. You, you know, women are acceptable as, uh, as lead singers, but we're, the very few women have been encouraged or um, uh, lauded for their guitar skill. And Renata's just, she's incredible. It's scary to watch her play. She's so good. Yeah, and she was. So very good. We faced a double barrier, both me <laughs> being in the band and her. It's kind of like, yeah. we're like, ugh. <laughs> Major kudos. As a transgender individual, you see life very different than others. What mm -hmm. advice do you have for the future generation in the LGBT, LGBT community and our allies? What, me different than others? In what way? <laughs> Well, we are. I mean, we we've had a life that most oh, you mean, people you're talking can't about transgender imagine. people as being different from others, as opposed to me being different than other transgender people. No, no, in general, no, 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 no. In general. general. Oh. The... I mean, I I I, I yeah. hope to be you know, a unique person, um, somebody <laughs> that uh, leaves a memory, hopefully not too negative. Um, I think that one thing that trans people can bring to society is is a perspective of both genders that very few people rarely get to have because we do get to see life from both viewpoints, from both genders. And I think if you look at it a way is that maybe we're, we, we have the opportunity to more be more spiritually uh, evolved from having to face all of the challenges that we do face, both physical and uh, uh, psychological, emotional, both. That's, three things, that's not both, uh, but all the different challenges that we face going through transition that has a, an effect on us that gives us an inner strength so we can be uh, an example to other people in terms of, uh, of, of, how, of, of coping with uh, adversity and rising above one's challenges and so forth. And, and then there is the, you know, the, the, the gender perspective and uh, my hope is that someday, you know, it's trendy to be trans. Absolutely, and the like you said, I uh, I agree a hundred percent with how you said that we get to experience both sides. Have you ever had the epiphany that, oh my God, you know that I, the kind of person I was before towards women, and had that totally changed and perceived, and I'm like. Oh my God! I'm marrying my old self. 
I mean, that kind of epiphany thing. <laughs> well, the thing is, you, I believe that relationships well, are our biggest teachers. Let me answer that. To tell you the truth, I was always a feminist. You know, in the 70s, I was rooting for Billie Jean King instead of Bobby Riggs. I've mm -hmm. always been cognizant of chauvinism. I've always, uh, you know, put, I mean, if you met, if you met my mom, you'd know why, because my mom is one of the coolest, most awesome individuals in the world. And, you know, she was my role model, probably in more ways than she intended. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think from my mom, I learned a healthy appreciation and respect for women. So I don't think in my, in my case, I necessarily evolved that much. Okay. Well, we want to thank you for being on the show. Um, it's been a great interview. Definitely, you're a very dynamic, colorful individual. And uh, I hit it on the nail when I went searching and I found you. And I'm so very glad that you joined us. Thank you for having me. As am I. Thank you so much it for was kind of Great fun. And right now, we want to make a quick announcement. Stay tuned for the post show. Yes, stay tuned for the post show. Don't leave us yet. Uh, Rogue Arizona State Representative John Cavana wants to pass a bill that would throw trans people in jail for using public restrooms. We need to stop him now. If the bill passes with this amendment, police could stop any woman trying to use a woman's restroom. She'd have to show proof that she's a woman, and if she doesn't have ID or gender, or the proper gender on her ID doesn't match, then they, she could have six months in jail or a $2,500 fine. When asked why the bill targeted trans people, he explained that it was because he thinks they're weird. The law would lead to extreme gender policing. Anyone gender non-conforming would need ID just to be in public, just in case. Already trans people face extreme violence and discrimination in public spaces. This bill makes it even less safe to be a trans person in Arizona. Tell the Arizona State Legislature to uphold the rights of trans people and visit the website that you see on the screen. That's www.allout.org slash en slash action slash Arizona. Jeez, that's a long website. I mean, long uh, URL. Let's yes. put it that and way. for him with the statement, you're weird, nobody, you're weird. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, bathrooms are bathrooms, you know. Hey, and all politicians are liars. And how many politicians have been with a trans woman? Hmm, mm -hmm. I'd love to take a status poll on that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's crazy. Before we used to have a little hole in the ground to use the bathroom. Now yeah, these yeah. stalls are sitting there worried about. Next, they're going to have like security guards. May I see your ID, please? You know, that's crazy. Yeah, crazy sorry, man. you can't go in there. What, what idiot? Well, thank you guys for joining us yet again. On another Sunday. Thank we you so had very much. A lot of fun as we always do. We enjoyed having Christine on the show. Thank you, Joe, yes. for all the hard work you do and making things flow nice and smooth and backstage. All the pictures and videos and all that great stuff. I know I drive you crazy sometimes <laughs> trying to get things flowing, but we love you. We thank you so much as we love everyone out there. Before I just knock over the microphone. <laughs> Destroy the studio. Yeah, what the hell? Yeah. But remember to, to always, always love, love yourselves, yourselves too. too. And keep rocking. Next week we have, who do we have actually? Da, 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 da. And we need to get you yeah, some Gabo Galoba. Yes, Gabo Galoba, well, because I've never checked. But we're going to have amazing guests coming up. Coy Mathis um, and parents and the legal team. Yes. Uh, Jazz and Jeanette. Um, just great guests coming up. And so stay tuned for more great shows on Transition Radio TV on Not Straight TV. Dot TV. Dot TV. <laughs> dot, dot. Yeah.